Okay, um, so welcome to today's lecture on computational social choice. Uh, the outline for today is that we continue to talk about Kamini's rule, which is a really nice social preference function. So we saw some characterizations last time. Um, and then we will talk about uh, whether we can compute Kamini rankings efficiently. So this is obviously an, an open question, open for us at least at this point, that we would like to resolve. Um, and then we move on to the next escape route, which is to use expansion consistency conditions. And there we will start to talk about the top cycle, which is a very nice um, and interesting social choice function. Okay, regarding Kamini's rule, so as you have seen in the forum, so I need to correct two things. Um, the definition of Condorcet consistency, as we defined it, was um, too weak, and the definition of LIAA was too strong. So this is because in the previous version of this course, we assumed that there are no majority ties. So let me just quickly show you how the definition changed. So this is the definition oops, of Condorcet consistency for social preference functions. And the first part here, um, so we have two alternatives, X and Y, that are adjacent. And then if X is preferred in a collective ranking to Y, then X should be weakly majority preferred to Y. So this is the same as before. So this is the, the previous part of the definition. And now we have this extra condition. Um, which wasn't there last time, which is important. Um, and that basically says is that if you have a majority tie between two alternatives, um, and these two alternatives are adjacent in a Kamini ranking, then um, there should be, so th then for every Kamini ranking that is returned by the function, there should also be the Kamini ranking in which these two alternatives are exchanged. Okay, so these two alternatives can be swapped. So this here, um, Maybe some of you have, have trouble understanding this notation here. This is just a fancy way of saying that we are removing the edge from x to y, and then we are adding the edge from y to x, Okay, because relations are just sets, as we have seen last time. So this is just turning around the edge between x and y. And as I written in the forum, so I gave more details there. So actually, this second part of the Condorcet consistency condition is the one that is exploited the most in the proof. So th that emphasizes what I already said last time, that um, the way Young defined Condorcet consistency is um, perhaps a bit debatable, especially this, this second tie-breaking part probably doesn't really have the natural flavor of Condorcet consistency. Of, of course, it talks about the majority relation, um, but it turns out for this characterization, so the second part is really essential, the, the way how to break ties. And regarding LIIA, so we have um, this change here. So for LIIA, everything was the same, except now the consequence is different. Oh, maybe let's not cross it out, but just underline it. So the consequence is different. Um, so here, what this means is, is that um, if you have two rankings, two Kamini rankings for two different preference profiles, and these two preference profiles agree on the relative ranking of X and Y. So all the voters have exactly the same preferences between X and Y. Um, then we can take one of these Kamini rankings, and here what is done here is we just remove the pairwise comparison between X and Y, and we replace it with the pairwise comparison between X and Y from the other Kamini ranking. So they can just be exchanged. So it's similar to what you have seen in the Condorcet consistency condition. So this part essentially is like, again, like a special way how to break ties. And, and one of the reasons why we need these um, slightly uglier conditions here is because Kamini rankings have to be strict. So whenever there are ties, um, this is resolved by having two versions, one where X is on top of Y and one where Y is on top of X. Um, so if for the, if, for instance, the Kamini rankings are unique, um, and this is the case for almost all preference profiles, so this can actually be shown, um, then this really has the flavor of um, independence of the relevant alternatives. Um, because in that case, it just says that the relative ranking of two adjacent alternatives, X and Y, only depends on the preferences of the voters between X and Y, and not on anything else. So the important part here is that these two preference profiles, R and R prime, can be completely different, um, except for the rankings of the alternatives, X and Y. Okay, um, so some uh, additional things that I would like to mention at this point is, for instance, um, that um, if you take all of these axioms from the second characterization of Young and you just drop LIIA, um, then there's a function that satisfies all of these axioms except LIIA, and that is a function that is different from Kamini's rule. So you have, you have seen 
uh, constructions like these before, if you want to show the independence of axioms and characterizations, you take all of the axioms but one, and then you show that there's a function different from the one that is being characterized that satisfies all of these axioms but one. Um, and interestingly here for, um, for the second characterization, if you take everything except LIA, the function that satisfies all of these axioms and that is different from Kemeny is the border social preference function. So we can take border scores in order to define a social preference function in the natural way. So by borders rule, we get scores for the alternatives. And then we can just take all the rankings um, based on the different border scores. And if there are ties be, uh, be between alternatives that have the same border score, we just break them in both ways. Um, so this defines a social preference function. And that function satisfies all of the axioms except LIIA. Um, so, for instance, the fact that it satisfies reinforcement should not come as a complete surprise to you because we have characterized scoring rules, in including borders rule, using the reinforcement axiom. And another thing that I would like to mention, um, if you look at this characterization or both of these characterizations, um, I, th the story I told you last time was is, uh, that there is this notion of Condorcet consistency and the notion of reinforcement, and they are incompatible for social choice functions. And then Young came along and had this beautiful characterization of Kemeny's rule, which um, unifies these two different approaches to social choice. And that is true. So the, the, the theorem is true. But we have to take into account here that um, this is really for social preference functions. Okay? And I mentioned when I introduced reinforcement that the condition of reinforcement seems a bit weaker for social preference functions, because if you have two different electorates, reinforcement only has an interesting consequence if the uh, uh, if there are Kemeny ranks rankings for both of these electorates that are completely the same. Okay? Whereas for social choice functions, the choice sets need to overlap, but here we have to have exactly the same Kemeny rankings for two different electorates. And um, this seems to be more uh, difficult to, to satisfy. And um, of course, everything we said about social choice functions and reinforcement is still in place. So for instance, you should not be fooled by uh, for instance, by assuming that if you just take the winners of Kemeny ranking, so this defines a natural social choice function, and we will study it also further today. We, rather than just looking at the rankings, we can just take the top alternatives of the Kemeny rankings. As I said, in, in most cases, there will be unique Kemeny rankings, so it's really a nice social choice function that is, um, in most profiles, even resolute. And if there are ties, we can just take all the top alternatives of all the different Kemeny rankings. That defines a social choice function. Um, and this social choice function is also a Condorcet extension, right? because if there is a Condorcet winner, the Condorcet winner will be on top of all the Kemeny rankings. Um, and um, so it, it seems like a nice social choice function, but uh, this social choice function cannot satisfy reinforcement. Right? So I think that, that emphasizes uh, the difference between social preference and social choice functions. So if you just take the Kemeny winners, we are talking about a Condorcet extension, and we have seen last week that no Condorcet extension satisfies reinforcement. So last week I showed you a proof that works for any Condorcet extension. And you can just, so the proof was basically just a, a general construction or a generic construction that works for any Condorcet extension. You can just look at these profiles that we used in the proof and apply Kemeny's rule, and then you will see that Kemeny's rule as a social choice function violates reinforcement. Um, as a social preference function, it doesn't. Okay, so that is just something that I wanted to emphasize. So here uh, we have reinforcement for social preference functions, which is a different condition than the one for social choice functions. Okay, um, anything else? No, I don't think so. So let's continue. Um, so interestingly, um, Kemeny's rule um, has been reinvented over and over again many times um, by many different people. Um, so the first uh, d definition, or almost definition, of Kemeny's rule is due to Condorcet. So this is this is something I mentioned uh, last week. So that that Peyton Young actually tried to decipher what Condorcet originally meant, and for three alternatives, it's definitely Kemeny's rule. And for more than three alternatives, he didn't quite get it right. But but Young's argument was that he was describing the maximum likelihood um, social um, preference function, and, and that would be Kemeny's rule, as he has shown. So. Um, Condorcet can be also seen as the, uh, the, the source of, of Kemeny's rule. So sometimes this rule is, is also called the Condorcet method for that reason. Um, well, then, of course, Kemeny himself, and then there are a couple of other authors. Um, one that is a bit amusing uh, is, is uh, Richard Phobes, the last one on this list here. So 
he invented or reinvented Kamini's rule in the 90s. So you can, so this is a hyperlink and you can click on this website. It's still running. I just checked yesterday. Um, and he called this method the vote fair method because he wasn't aware of Kamini's rule. And then only he has written a book about that and he's, he has videos on his website advocating this rule. He calls it the vote fair method. And when, whenever there is uh, like a political election in the US or when American Idol is running, for instance, he's running the vote fair method, which is Kamini's rule on the preference profiles he gets. And then he says, that the vote fair method winner would have been this candidate. So, um, so he makes an argument for Kamini's rule, which is good because it's, it's really a good social choice function or social preference function to be pr precise. Um, the funny thing is just that he doesn't really completely acknowledge that he just reinvented something. So I think on his website he says something like um, the vote fair method turned out to be mathematically equivalent to Kamini's rule, <laughs> which is correct, but... <laughs> um, with, with Kamini's rule, reinventing it is, is actually not that much of a surprise because it can be characterized using so many different um, points of view on social choice. So we have seen this maximum likelihood model um, in the beginning of uh, last week's course. Um, then you can have this view where you just say, okay, um, the problem in social choice in general are these cycles in the majority graph. So now we want to get rid of the cycles by inverting edges. Okay, now we want to invert the fewest number of edges until no more cycles are left. That is a very natural idea, and that also leads to Kamini's rule. And that's why, why people keep reinventing it over and over again. There are so many different ways um, how we can define Kamini's rule. Actually, a postdoc of mine, um, I think in 2006 and seven or something, reinvented Kamini's rule twice. So, so he was telling me that he found a great social choice function. And then after we looked at it uh, for a while, we realized that it's exactly the same thing as Kamini's rule. Um, so here's just a list of things that describes um, how Kamini's rule can be seen. So maximum likelihood is what we have seen last time. Then this median thing is actually quite interesting. Um, because um, a very natural way how you get to Kamini's rule, and this was one of the ways um, that, that my postdoc rediscovered many years ago, is that you can look at the space of um, preference relations. Okay, so then uh, you have all these different preference relations for some fixed number of alternatives, and then you can define the distance between two different preference relations. And one natural way to do so is using the Kendall Tau distance, which I, I think last week I briefly mentioned it on, one, on, on this. Um, on this whiteboard write-up, that if you just count how many swaps you have to make in order to go from one preference relation to another, or from one ranking to another, we're just talking about strict preferences here, this is called the Kendall Tau distance. And therefore, you can think of a space, let's just assume this is some space of preference relations, and then if you have a couple of voters, so each of these voters correspond to a point in this space, right? Um, so it's, it's just some metric space because we have defined a metric that tells us how far one relation is from another. Okay, so if two rankings are completely opposed, they have maximum distance. They are on, on opposing ends uh, of the space. And now what Kamini's rule does, does is it tries to find a ranking for which the sums of distances is minimal. Okay, and this also shouldn't be a complete surprise because if you think about the definition of Kamini, so it's just counting pairwise agreements, this is exactly what it is doing. So it's trying to find a point in the space for which, for which all these distances summed up are minimal. So it should be as close as possible to this uh, set of preference relations by the voters. Um, and sums of distances corresponds to median, that's why sometimes it's also called the median method. Um, Another name that is sometimes given to Kamini's rule is, um, or the output of Kamini's rule, those rankings are sometimes called consensus rankings, which also makes a lot of sense, right? Because we are trying to find a consensus in, in the way where we try to have as many pairwise agreements um, with the voters' preferences as possible. Um, okay, scoring rule. So this is something <laughs> I guess I need to emphasize because sometimes in previous years, uh, since I mentioned scoring rule on the same slide as Kamini's rule, some students have thought that Kamini's rule is actually a scoring rule, so it belongs to the class of composed scoring rules or something. That is, of course, not the case. I just mean here what we did last time, so it can be seen as a scoring rule on rankings, because when we first computed Kamini's rule for some preference profile, we just looked at all the possible preference uh, of all the possible rankings over the alternatives, and then we just gave them scores in order of the pairwise agreement. Um, well, and the last thing here is the one that we will look at in most detail in now if we want to compute Kamini rankings, and this is also something that we have studied last week. So Kamini's rule returns um, 
or can be defined by looking at maximal weight acyclic majority subgraphs. Okay, so if you look at this at these majority graphs, which we are doing uh, more and more in this course, um, um, then we and on these edges, then we have these weights depending on how how heavy one of these edges is. And we, if you want to find a maximal subgraph in terms of the accumulated weight on the edges and the subgraph should not contain any cycles, then this is precisely what we are doing in order to, to get a Kemeny ranking. So this is something we already discussed last time. Um, right, so I think, yeah, so the last bullet here is a, is a quote by Peyton Young, uh, who, I, who you know by now because he's really a big fan of Kemeny's rule, um, where he says that, I predict that the time will come when Kemeny's rule is considered a standard tool for political and group decision-making. Um, that was in 95. Um, hasn't happened yet. Well, there are some some applications, but not really that many. So in, in, in general, in social choice, I think I mentioned it at some point, it's quite um, it's quite difficult, especially for political elections, to get something replaced with something else. Um, but for instance, I know that, for instance, a, a colleague of mine at a university in the US, um, they have been using Kemeny's rule in order to aggregate their rankings when they had a hiring committee for a new professor at the faculty. So then there were like five people who ranked the different candidates, and then they computed a Kemeny ranking of that, so because he, he actually implemented Kemeny's rule. Um, and then they looked at this consensus ranking, and they didn't make the decision just based on the ranking, but they looked at this consensus ranking, and then they started the discussion based on that. Um, so, yeah, so Kamenis rule, I think, is really quite uh, um, an elegant and practical thing to use. I think you had a question, yes. 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 Okay, yes, so, so strategic manipulation is something, so we have covered it a little, uh, it a little bit in this course. Um, and so if you, if you consider Kemeny's rule as a social preference function, you have to first make sure how you define strategic manipulation because the outcome then would be a ranking of the alternatives. But for instance, if you just take the Kemeny win winners, so Kemeny's rule can be strategically manipulated, that's for sure. So you can find preference profiles where there's a unique Kemeny winner and then an agent can lie about her preferences in order to get a different Kemeny winner which she actually prefers. Um, I wouldn't say that it's really because of this nature of maximizing pairwise agreement because we will see in a couple of weeks, so sometime next year, we will, we will prove a very general impossibility theorem that I already mentioned in the first lecture, which basically proves that every social choice function that is somewhat reasonable is, uh, can be strategically manipulated. So it's not only Kemeny's rule, but virtually any social choice function can be manipulated, unfortunately. Um, okay, so uh, any other questions? Um, so uh, the next thing that I would like to, to discuss or study is how we can we find Kemeny rankings given some preference profile. And maybe some of you uh, already thought about how this could be done efficiently. Um, so for instance, if you think about three alternatives, um, as Condorcet basically did, so at least the correct part of his, of his statement here was for three alternatives, it's relatively easy, right? Because uh, you look at this majority graph on three alternatives. Um, well, if there's no cycle in the majority graph, you're basically done, right? You can just take all the Kemeny rankings that still fit in this majority graph. In most cases, it will be a unique Kemeny ranking. Um, if there's a cycle in this uh, three element majority graph, um, well, then you have to break the cycle. And the way you do it is just that you delete the edge with the lowest weight. Okay, um, so there can also be ties, then you get several Kemeny rankings, but in most cases all these edges, um, if you have a large number of voters, will have different weights from each other, and then you just delete the edge with the lowest weight, then there's no cycle anymore, and then using these uh, remaining two edges, if it was just a strict majority graph, you can get a Kemeny ranking. Um, so for three alternatives it's simple, but as I already hinted at last time, if you have larger majority graphs, well, then you will have more cycles. So the, it's easy for three alternatives because there can be at most one cycle in a, in a graph on three vertices. Uh, if you have more than three alternatives, of course, there can be many cycles and then can, they can overlap um, and that can make things quite difficult. I don't know if some of you maybe looked it up already or something, but still I uh, would like to t t have you take a guess. So who, who thinks that Kemeny's rule can be computed efficiently in polynomial time? and that we will learn about an algorithm in today's lecture. <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe I was giving it away by uploading those slides yesterday about computational complexity. <laughs> um, 
So I assume everybody else has no clue or thinks that computing Cambridge rule is difficult, um, and that is actually the case. Um, so computing Cambridge rule can be shown to be NP-hard, um, and uh, the intuitive reason before we look at the formal proof of this is really just that if you want to find a combination of objects, as you do here, with minimal accumulated weight, um, so these objects would be edges um, in, from the cycles, that already smells like NP-hardness. So if, if you have seen some reductions, and maybe some of you are more familiar with computational complexity than others, but I would hope that at least everybody here has, at least has some basic understanding of reduction proofs and has seen problems like vertex cover or three set, for, for which, uh, which are known to be NP-hard. Um, and Kemeny, computing Kemeny rankings, if you look at larger instances, already has the flavor of something that could be hard. But we want to make this more precise. Um, mm, ah yeah, so maybe let me just add in, in general, so because for the functions that we have studied so far, computational complexity was not really such a big deal because we had scoring rules, of course, they can be computed efficiently. Um, which uh, all the other functions that we had in the first lecture were, were easy to compute. So we had, for the restricted domains, we had approval voting and we had median voting for single peak preferences. So all these could be computed um, quickly. Um, but now the fur further we proceed in this course, the more often we will encounter functions for which it is unclear whether they can be computed efficiently. And then the most pressing question for us as computer scientists, at, at least most of us, I, I think, are computer scientists, is, is can we compute this efficiently or not? Because if, if something cannot be computed efficiently, this is really um, a big problem um, that in most cases has not been considered in the standard literature on social choice because economists don't really have, uh, typically don't have a background in computational complexity, so they don't have, usually don't have any axioms that say that something should be efficiently computable, but you could consider it as an axiom that the function, apart from satisfying, say, reinforcement, it should also be efficiently computable because if it is not, it doesn't mean that we cannot compute it. So if Kamini's rule, we can still compute for three, four, five, and, and, and more alternatives. But if, if you look at a very large instance with many alternatives, say 100 or something, then um, no, no modern computer can actually solve it. And also in the foreseeable future, we cannot efficiently compute a Kamini ranking, as we will see. So I haven't shown you the proof yet. Um, OK, so um, before we prove the NP-hardness, um, and don't worry, so if you don't know much about reduction proofs, this will be a very simple reduction. So it's, it's uh, really just a relatively straightforward reduction argument. Um, but before we, we do this, we need an auxiliary statement um, that is not only useful for, computer, uh, for, for giving this hardness proof, but also in general, we will be using it all the time. And this auxiliary statement is called the McGarvey theorem. And the reason why this is useful is because the further we, we proceed in this course, the more often we will abstract away from the preference profiles. We are already doing this to some extent and only look at these majority graphs. So I mentioned it several times already that many functions that we will study in the future, we will only look at the graphs and we don't really care about the underlying preferences of the voters. But in order um, to really um, uh, have full justification to only look at these majority graphs, it would be nice to know which class of directed graphs we can actually get from preference profiles. Right? So we know that we can have a preference profile and every preference profile induces some directed graph, some majority graph, um, but it could be only a subclass of majority graphs. And especially if we study the computational complexity of some th something, it's, it's important if um, the possible um, majority graphs would only be a subset of all the majority graphs you could think of. But it turns out, um, using McGarvey's theorem, that for every directed graph, and by directed I mean like a simple directed graph, so there only, there's only one edge between any pair of alternatives, so no double edges or anything. So for every directed graph, we can find a preference profile which induces that graph. Okay, so this is like a completeness result, which gives us um, reasons to completely focus on those graphs because every graph can be obtained by some underlying preference profile. Okay, um, so the, the question or the statement of this theorem, I hope is clear, right? So it's, we know that uh, preference profiles induce majority graphs. If we have a preference profile, we can draw the corresponding graph. Now we want to turn it around. So we, if we have a graph, can we find a preference profile that gives us exactly this graph? Okay, so this is what we are uh, going to show. Um, and again, don't worry if you don't like proofs because this one is extremely simple. Um, and it's so simple that I'm going to demonstrate it by means of one example. 
So let me draw one majority graph. Um, in many cases from now on, so not in today's lecture, but from the next lecture on, we will focus on so-called tournament graphs. So I think this term has been floating around for several weeks already. So t tournament graphs are just graphs. They are also called complete oriented graphs. So that means between any pair of alternatives, we have one directed edge. Um, in principle, because there can be majority ties, um, it's also possible that there's no edge between any pair of alternatives because if there's a majority tie, we will just not draw this edge. But uh, later on in this course, we will mostly focus um, on the case where there are no majority ties because then things uh, are much nicer. Um, so here, let's look at an example um, where we do have majority edges between any pair of alternatives. Okay, so it's a four cycle and then we have these two additional edges here. And then the question is, we want to find a preference profile which induces this majority graph. Okay, so of course there are many ways that you could, what you could try now, so maybe you could just try to enumerate all preference profiles with at most seven voters or something and then just see whether they induce this graph, so that would not be very efficient, like our first naive approach for checking single peakness. Um, so what would help us if we have like, like, um, like an invariant condition that we can somehow add edges to this graph. So we start with the empty graph and then we can add edges to the graph without messing up, that we have, uh, uh, with, without messing up everything that we have constructed before. Right? So what I would like to have um, is that we only look at the empty graph with A, B, C, D and then we would like to add one edge um, and not uh, turn around any of the majority edges that we have constructed before. And if we have, if we have a tool like this, we can add one edge after another um, in order to get this, this graph here. So to make this more concrete, so let's for instance, let's take this one here. Let's look at this here. So if we want to have a graph which only contains this orange edge here, Okay, and all the other things are majority ties. So there are no other edges. That means all the other ones are majority ties. How could we do this? Any ideas? So what, which voters would we need to add to the preference profile in order, in order to only get this orange edge here? So you're raising your hand? I, okay. Yes, two suffice even. So two is also good for getting ties, right? So because if you have two voters and they have opposing preferences on some of these pairs, then they cancel each other out basically. And then these two voters, if they if they have the same um, preference between what is it uh, B and C, then then that that would be an edge, right? If both of these voters agree that B is better than C, so maybe. Let's start, so if we add two voters who prefer B to C. Okay, so these are two columns. I already gave a little hint on how to complete these columns here. Okay, so then that would of course be a majority, so it would even like all of these two voters prefer B to C. And now what we want to make sure is that um, we place the other alternatives in these two preference rankings such that we only have majority ties. Okay, so the other two alternatives are just A and D, um, so that means we put, for instance, A and D in, in arbitrary order on top of the left voter here, and then we put them in inverse order for the next voter, right? Um, and if we do it like this, maybe let's use... Okay, now let's just have no highlight for the other ones. Um, so since A and D are on top of B and C in one voter and below of B and C for the other voter, we do have majority ties between A, D and B, C. And then between A and D internally, we also have a majority tie because one of the voters prefers A to D and the other one prefers D to A. Okay, and, and once you have understood this, and I, I would hope that many of you have, um, you can construct the entire majority graph, right? Because this is just one building block and we can repeat this over and over again. So let's, for instance, uh, take this edge next. And that means for in, in order to get this edge, we would have to need two voters who prefer C to D. Okay, and then the other two alternatives would be A and B. So let's the first one rank A on top of B and the second one B on top of A. 
So AB here and BA here. Then we have the second edge. Okay. So at this point, let's not worry about efficiency. Okay. So it's uh, one edge at a time. But once we have a if we have a majority graph, we can add pairs of voters such that every pair of voters induces one of these edges. Um, so we could on doing this. So how many voters would we then have in the end if we just continue doing this? It's four alternatives. Yes. Yes. So it's six edges. <laughs> it's it's twelve, right? Yeah. So it's uh, maybe let's write this down. So it's uh, four times three divided by two. So if it's four alternatives. So four times three divided by two is the number of edges, and um, we need two edge, uh, two voters for each edge, and that means we would have a total of twelve voters here. Okay. Um, and, and that is already the proof for McGarvey's theory. So, um, and we are using it as a computational tool in order to prove, for instance, hardness of Kamini's rule, uh, because with, with this thing, we have full justification for, just, uh, justification for only uh, considering majority graphs in the future. And uh, even though it, it may seem a bit inefficient, it's already sufficient here, because as we have seen here, um, well, the number of edges in the graph is quadratic and the number of alternatives. We have two voters for each edge. Um, so that means here we have 12 voters, even though this can be done much if more efficiently, I'm going to show you. But the number of voters is only polynomial in the number of vertices, right? Okay, because the number of edges is quadratic in the number of alternatives, and then we have two voters, it's just a constant, it doesn't matter at all. So for any graph, even if the graph has uh, like a very large number of alternatives, we still only have a number that is polynomial in those alternatives uh, for the voters if we construct an underlying preference profile. Okay, so um, that's nice, and, and that shows us, obviously we can do this for any majority graph, so from now on we don't, we can really completely focus on these majority graphs because every majority graph is induced by some preference profile. As long as the number of voters can be large enough, right? If you have a restricted setting where we have only like three voters or four voters or something, then we cannot get any majority graph. But if uh, the number of voters is not restricted, any majority graph can be obtained. And now, in order to show you how this can be done a bit more efficiently, and also in a s perhaps somehow more useful way, is maybe let's first look at the edges. So sometimes we also looked at the weighted majority graphs, where the edge weight is the number of voters who prefer x to y minus the number of voters who prefer y to x. Um, for this graph here, all these edge weights would be two, right? Um, okay. Um, now. Um, if we want to get a preference profile that induces the same graph where all these edge, edge weights are one, okay, because um, well, if, if they are one, it's nicer for uh, also later on for Kamini's rule because that means that a single voter can, by changing the pairwise comparison of a single voter, we can just immediately turn turn around the edge. Um, we could do something different because the approach that I just sketched here will always uh, return an even number of voters. So the preference profile will always have an even number of voters because we will add a pairs of voters for every preference, uh, for every edge in the majority graph. And um, now the, like, the improvement that I'm showing you will always get you an, an odd number of voters and at the same time you can bring down the number of voters significantly depending on the underlying graph here. Um, okay, so let me ignore the tools here. Um, because one thing that you can do is you define the preferences of the first voter arbitrarily. Okay, so you just take any preference relation. Ideally, you take one which coincides with many edges of this directed majority graph. And then you just, add, then you just did what we did before, you add pairs of voters that turn around edges. Okay, because if you just had this single voter in the beginning, the edges that you added had only weight one, and th then if you then add pairs of voters, you can turn around the edges um, that you just added before. Um, so maybe let's, let's see how this would work for this example here. So we start with one arbitrary voter here. Now if you want to find a ranking of the alternatives, um, which uh, like coincides with as many edges as possible, um, so it's basically a Kemeny ranking, right? <laughs> which, which one would that be? So we want to define the preferences of the first voter 
such that the first voter has many edges in common with this majority graph. What could that ranking be? Yes? Yes, sounds good. So th there's a reason why they are numbered ABC or called ABCD. So if you have ABCD, um, then you already have added this edge, this edge, this edge, this edge, this edge, right? The only disagreement that you have with this voter is this edge here, okay? So all these edges here are already in the majority graph if you just have the single voter. And that means now you just add one pair of voters in order to, to turn around this edge here. So because using a pair of voters, you can, you can turn this edge around and you're not messing up anything else because that's how we constructed this thing here. So that means, um, maybe let's use different color here, blue, that if you want to turn around this edge, um, we just add two voters who prefer D to A because the first voter preferred A to D. So his preference is the wrong direction if you want to call it that way. Um, so you need two voters who prefer D to A just as we had before. Um, and then we just add the other alternatives such that nothing else has changed. So BC and CB. And then we have exactly the same majority graph. Okay, so with just three voters rather than 12. And it's, it can be checked that you cannot get this majority graph using less than three voters. Um, well, it's pretty obvious because if you have only two voters, there would be majority ties somewhere, um, unless they completely agree on everything. <laughs> um, and with one voter, clearly, you cannot get cycles. Okay, so this is the minimal number of voters. Um, so I'm going to mention this, I think, in one of the slides. So it's so many, so because now many questions maybe pop up in your head. So how can we always find the minimal number of voters? So which kind of majority graphs can we get with only three voters and five voters? So many of these things are open. So there are quite a couple of open questions, in particular computational questions regarding that. But f for, for the statement that I just gave you, for McGarvey's theorem, all that we need to know now is, is that we can have an arbitrary majority graph and then construct a preference profile um, that induces, let's just take this variant here, that induces this specific majority graph using an odd number of voters. And then all the edges here would have weight one. Okay. Okay. Um, so I think there are now many things that I just said. Um, okay, so this is really like the, the entire proof in one sentence. So I, I guess the example then explains it completely, but here, the sentence just says, for every edge, we add two voters who both prefer x to y and rank all the other alternatives diametrically opposed, as we did in the example. And even if all the edges in the majority graph that we are looking at have weight 1, we can find such a profile, and therefore we just define the preferences of the first voter arbitrarily, and then we just add a pair of pairs of voters. In the example that I gave you, this was only three, but of course, in other examples, if there's not so much disagreement, uh, not so much agreement with the first voter, you may need to turn around more than just one edge. Um, okay, so we will use McGarvey's theorem as a building block, for instance, for proving uh, hardness of Kamini's rule. But as I mentioned, so there are uh, interesting follow-up questions. So the construction that I showed you uses a quadratic number of voters, right? Because we are just adding pairs of voters, and uh, for if each edge and the number of edges in, in a majority graph. Um, is uh, m square, where, where m is the number of alternatives. And if you are wondering about the optimal results, so then Erdős and Moser, so I'm pretty sure at least the mathematicians have heard about Paul Erdős, a very famous mathematician who contributed to many, many different areas. And they have, uh, so Erdős and uh, together with Moser, ha Moser has published a paper in 64, where they have shown that the number of required voters, if you want to get any graph, is theta m divided by log m. Okay, so there's a matching upper and lower bound, but there are hidden constants in there. Um, so this McGarvey construction doesn't seem very efficient using m square, and there are several tricks. Maybe we'll do an exercise on this at one point, where you c how you can actually improve this by, for instance, only requiring a linear number of voters um, rather than a quadratic number of voters, without going all the way down to what Erdős and Moser did. Um, so if, if you are thinking about which majority graphs you can get using a small number of voters, so this is also quite fascinating because um, 
I believe that you can every majority graph with up to seven vertices, you can, uh, so I'm only talking about tournaments now. So every tournament with up to seven vertices, you can get using only three voters. Um, so I, I'm always a bit surprised that three voters suffice to get so many different, because on, on seven and six and five vertices, there are many different structures that you can actually use, but all of them can be used by only three voters. Um, if you move on to five voters, if you're only looking at odd numbers of voters, because we are restricting attention to tournaments, so no majority ties, um, many things are open. So it's um, the smallest uh, known tournament, which cannot be induced by five voters, um, it has about 600 million vertices, and this was shown non-constructively. <laughs> um, so there's the conjecture that a specific tournament called the quadratic residue tournament of size 23 cannot be induced by five voters, and we've been working on this in the past, and uh, we perhaps we are not sure yet. I have a computer proof showing that uh, this specific tournament cannot be induced by five voters. So these questions are somewhat esoteric, but still it's, it's, it's fun working on these things. Um, Right. Okay. So, yeah, let me stop at this point. So, there are many things that can still be said about trying to optimize the number of photos, but for what we want to achieve at this point, proving hardness of Kamenich rule, we just need to know McGarvey's theory. Okay. Um, so, in order to prove hardness of something, uh, NP-hardness, we, we need to find a problem that we reduce from for, for the hardness proof. So, it will be polynomial time reduction. And the problem that we are using here is called feedback arc set. So, has anybody ever heard about that problem in computer science class? Ah, okay. Um, so, I'm a bit surprised because it's, uh, as is stated here, it's, it's one of the original uh, 21 NP-complete problems. So if, uh, for those of you interested in theoretical computer science and also in your introductory courses, you have probably learned that the notion of NP-completeness was invented independently by Cook and Levin. So Levin worked in, in Russia behind the Iron Curtain, and they both had the same brilliant idea of defining the notion of NP-completeness. Um, and then, um, uh, like people added, keeping uh, keep kept adding problems to this list of NP-complete problems. So satisfiability was one of the first ones, and and then there's something like vertex cover or um, Hamiltonian path or th these kinds of problems. Um, and in the original list published by Carp in a paper of 21 NP-complete problems, by now there are like not even thousands, probably millions of NP-complete problems known. Um, and um, but feed feedback arc set was one of the like first problems that was known to be NP-complete. And um, what does this problem say? So the feedback arc set problem asks, is it possible to make a given directed graph acyclic by removing k edges? <laughs> okay, so in the, once you have seen this definition, you probably see this strong relationship to Kamini rankings, right? Because last time I spent a couple of slides explaining how we can, rather than just counting pairwise agreements, we can look at the majority graph, then we first we inverted edges, then we showed that it's equivalent to delete edges if you only want to find the minimal number of edges that need to be deleted. So this very much sounds the, the, like the Kamini problem, um, except that this problem doesn't really talk about any weights on these edges. Okay, so there are also weighted versions. But it turns out that computing Kamini rankings is difficult, even if all the edges have the same weight. Okay, um, and, and that's also why McGarvey's construction is useful, the, the one that I showed you before, because here we can just take any uh, directed graph, we can find an underlying preference profile using an odd number of voters, which induces precisely that graph in the sense that every, weight has, every edge has exactly the same weight of one. Okay, and uh, using this, we can, we can then construct a reduction proof. Um, by the way, this book here so is a compendium um, of, uh, among other things. So it's first, it's an introduction to the notion of NP-completeness, which I think is really a great book. So it's quite old. It's from 79, I think. Um, and usually, so also when I was studying, I would never wanted uh, to, to look at a book which is several decades old, um, especially in computer science. But this is really a, a remarkable book. So some of the cartoons, for instance, that are used in the slide set about algorithms and complexity were taken from this book here. So I think it's a very nice and gentle introduction to the notion of NP-completeness. And the second half of the book is a large compendium of NP-complete problems, including feedback arc set and many, many other problems. I don't know, maybe 100 or more problems. Um, Last time I checked, this was the most cited book in computer science because, of course, whenever you prove that something is hard, you are referring to this book and say this is problem 85, uh, uh, which you are reducing from. Um, yeah, so it's really recommended. Um, 
So since uh, later on in this course we will focus on tournaments, um, it would also be nice to know whether this specific problem is also hard for tournaments. Right? So if a problem is hard for general directed graphs, uh, for any, any problem that is hard, so whenever a problem is hard for some set of instances, it could be that if you restrict the set of instances that this, the problem suddenly becomes easy. Yeah? So because uh, then you of course have less, less uh, possible inputs and then the problem can be substantially easier than the one for, for any type of input. Um, and here in particular it would be nice to know whether feedback oxide is also difficult if you restrict attention to tournament graphs where we have an edge between any pair of vertices. And interestingly this was an acknowledged open problem for many years. Um, so because that, that problem was first proposed in 72 and they probably shortly after that it was uh, asked uh, whether this also is difficult for tournaments and then um, 2006 and 2007 so I was already working in computational social choice at the time that's why I, uh, that's why I remember this when all these papers came out it was shown that feedback access is still NP complete even in the subclass of tournaments um, and interestingly, so all these three papers came out independently and proved the same thing using different, um, dif different techniques, um, but they call, all came out with the same statement and solved this open problem roughly at the same time. And this is just good to know because then we know that this problem, even in tournaments, is difficult. Because if we use this for, say, hardness of Kamini rankings or maybe later on for other functions, it would be a bit bad if, if there's an odd number of voters then the, then the hardness doesn't hold anymore and then we suddenly have uh, like uh, we, we don't have these hardness results anymore but we have efficient algorithms for these kinds of problems. Okay, um, now let's, let's look at how we can prove this hardness thing. Um, so it was first done by Bartholdi et al. in 89 um, which I'm pretty sure it's, it's, it's the first real paper that can be considered a paper in computational social choice because that was the first time that somebody actually took concepts from computer science, in this case NP completeness, and applied it to a concept from social choice. And, and they showed that deciding whether there exists a ranking whose Kamini score is at least S is an NP complete problem. We will, so maybe this problem at, at this point seems a bit artificial to you because we are basically interested in finding Kamini rankings, um, but all these problems are related to each other and if this problem is hard then also finding Kamini rankings is hard as we will see later on. But usually if you talk about NP completeness, uh, not usually, but if you talk about NP completeness, you're talking about decision problems where the answer can only be yes or no. And that's why you need to phrase the problem in a version where the answer is just binary, yes or no. And this clearly is a binary problem in the sense that either there is a Kamini ranking who scores at least S or there is not. Um, okay. Mm. So now let me maybe here draw quickly how, how this kind of reduction works. So it's so because so it's, it's not a computational complexity course, but it's one thing that you should definitely know as computer scientists is how in principle you would do a reduction because many well, one of the common mistakes is, is that people try to reduce from the problem for which they want to show hardness. But the first thing that to remember is, is that you start with a problem which you know is hard. In that case, it would be feedback arc set. Okay, so. That could be the set of instances of feedback arc set. Um, and then you find a function that takes any instance. So this is a set of problems. Okay, So it's, uh, each of these instances consists of a directed graph and the number of edges that needs to be uh, deleted in order to make the graph acyclic. And then we take an instance um, of this problem and we translate it to a problem of the Kamini nature here. So we, t we translate it to a problem asking, is there a Kamini ranking whose score is at least S? Okay, maybe let's use a different color for this set. So this is the set of Kamini rankings. So what I'm sketching here is a so-called many one reduction. Um, so we can take any instance here and translate it to an instance of that other problem here. And it's not necessary that we cover everything in this set here. So maybe let's use green for that. So it could be possible that we only that we're only mapping to a subset of instances of the Kamini problem. The important part, however, is, is that any feedback arc set problem we can take and we can map it over here to a problem of, um, of the, um, what we call it, Kamini score problem. And the other important thing about these reductions is, is that this translation here, taking an instance of this problem and translating it to a blue problem here, has to be uh, feasible in polynomial time. 
so, so this is a function, basically. So we're taking one instance and outputting another instance, and this has to be a polynomial computable function. Otherwise, um, um, this wouldn't work. OK, so now I think by now, since these problems are so similar, that that's why I'm saying that the reduction is not particularly difficult. Um, but I think it is, it's a very nice lesson in, in order to refresh your memories about reductions, because um, for this simple example, it clearly shows how one instance can be translated to another instance. So we had taken an instance of feedback arcset and converted it to an instance of the Kemeny score problem. So an, an feedback arcset instance is a directed graph and some integer k, which is this number of edges that needs to be deleted in order to make the graph acyclic. Okay, so feedback arcset means, can we make this graph acyclic by deleting k edges? And then the answer is yes or no. And now, this is where we use McGarvey's theorem, because now an instance of this Kemeny problem takes as an input a preference profile and a number s, which is the score of the ranking that we want to look at. Okay, so that means we first need to convert this graph into a preference profile. And this we can do, you do using McGarvey's theorem. So we construct a preference profile on the alternatives. Um, we t here take the version with an odd number of voters, so we could also take another one. I think this is the simplest one. Um, it takes at most, so I hope you can still see this, two times the number of edges plus one voters. So this is, so we have one voter with, with uh, like a random voter that we start with, and then we add pairs of voters for each edge. It's definitely less than two times e plus one. So it's a polynomial number, so that's the important thing to realize at this point. And then the majority, the strict majority relation of the preference profile that we construct is exactly the same as the edge set of the graph that we had. Okay, so that we, now we converted the input of the graph problem to an input of the social choice problem, which takes a preference profile. And now the only missing part, and this is really just uh, one where you have to get the numbers right, is we have to convert the other part of the input. For feedback arc set, it was the number k of edges. And for Kemeny score, it was s the Kemeny score. Okay, and we have to somehow translate this k into the appropriate s. Um, and this works as follows. So first, okay, so the lemma from the previous lecture is just the one where we showed that um, deleting the, low, the edges with the lowest accumulated weight will give us a Kemeny ranking. Um, all the edges have the same weight, so we are just counting the edges. And then the way how we translate k into s is as follows. Um, so here we have the total number of edges. Okay, um, and these are all majority edges. We, we have an odd number of voters. So um, on each of these edge, edges, because all these edges have weight one, we just barely have a majority. Um, and um, here, in order to compute the Kemeny score, we would need to count for all these edges um, the number of voters who prefer x to y um, for each majority x, uh, for each majority edge. And this is just barely more than one half of the voters. Um, so therefore, here it is n plus 1 over 2. Um, and then um, if, if the original majority graph would be acyclic, then that would be exactly the Kemeny score that we get. But we have to turn around some of the edges or remove some, let's say, remove some of these edges. Um, and this is why we have to sub subtract k here. Okay? We have to remove k edges in order to get rid of all the cycles. Okay, so this is just a bit the, the tedious part, but perhaps the mo more interesting part is the one uh, using McGarvey's theorem, where we can take a directed graph and then uh, translate this into a preference profile. Okay, and once we have done this, we have done exactly what I sketched here. So maybe let's remove, well, okay, let's, let's first look at the sketch. So we take an instance of feedback arc set, translate it to an instance of the Kemeny score problem, and this is exactly a polynomial time reduction, because everything that we are doing here can be done in polynomial time. Um, and therefore, no, maybe let's now remove it, because so you can see what's on the slide. Um, and, and this shows that deciding whether there exists a ranking whose Kemeny score is at least S is an NP-complete problem. So again, for those of you who are familiar with NP-completeness, you have seen these kinds of decision problems before, I'm sure. So where you have some threshold of score that needs to be exceeded in order to have a positive or negative instance. But we will now continue using this problem in order to, to tackle the perhaps more interesting problems of finding a Kemeny ranking, deciding whether some given candidate is on top of a Kemeny ranking, so that would be called a Kemeny winner, so that's perhaps also a very natural decision problem. So given some preference profile, is X a Kemeny winner, in the sense that X is on top of a Kemeny ranking? So all of these problems we can prove hard um, by reducing them, uh, by, by reducing from this type of problem that for which we have just shown hardness. 
Okay, because we have seen that the Kemeny score problem, that's the problem we have studied on the previous slide, is at least as hard as feedback arc set. And um, now it can be shown that finding a Kemeny ranking is at least as hard as the Kemeny score problem, and therefore also at least as hard as feedback arc set. Now, technically, um, we have to be careful now because the find a Kemeny ranking problem is not a decision problem. Right? So the answer of this is not yes or no, it's just a Kemeny ranking. Um, therefore, it cannot be in NP. So these problems, uh, problems that are not decision problems cannot be in NP. So this uh, is a problem which cannot be NP complete, but we can still show NP hardness using a so-called Turing reduction. Okay? And the Turing reduction just, just means um, that we, we can think of an... Mm, of an oracle, I think that's the most natural way to think about this. So we can, we can just make, even if you've never heard about reductions, I, th I think it makes a lot of sense. So we can just assume that there's a machine or an oracle that can find Kemeny rankings for us. And we assume that this can be done efficiently. And then we will get a contradiction in the sense that if we have such a machine, then we could also um, efficiently answer this question uh, of the Kemeny score. So is there a Kemeny score uh, with at least, uh, is there a Kemeny ranking with a score at least S? This problem we can actually also solve if we have a machine that gives us Kemeny rankings. And I'm going to make this precise on this slide. Um, and that is what is called a, a Turing reduction, because we are reducing uh, for a search problem rather than a decision problem. OK, so we suppose we had, a, we had an oracle that efficiently computes a Kemeny ranking for some given preference profile. Um, so we, we only get the ranking, we don't get anything about the score. But once we have the ranking, of course, we can compute the Kemeny score of this particular ranking. Okay, because we just count the pairwise agreement. So we have this formula how we can just uh, compute the score of any ranking. So we take this Kemeny ranking and we know the score of this Kemeny ranking. And we also know that it's a Kemeny ranking because this oracle is supposed to give us a Kemeny ranking for sure. That means we know that there is no other ranking which has a higher score. And all rankings that have lower score are not Kemeny rankings. So this precisely gives us the threshold that we need in order to, to answer this score problem. Right? Because once we have a Kemeny ranking, we compute the score, and we know that every ranking that has the same score is also a Kemeny ranking. Every ranking that has a higher score is impossible, so there can be no such ranking. And every ranking that has a lower score is definitely no Kemeny ranking. So that means that if we denote this score of this particular ranking by S star, um, it's the highest uh, possible score of all rankings, because it's this oracle somehow magically gives us Kemeny rankings. We don't know how, but we assume that it, this oracle can do it in polynomial time. Um, but if we have this oracle at our disposal, if we can just use this machine, we can also ask, uh, we can also answer any query to this Kemeny score problem by just taking this threshold as star and then just looking um, whether um, the Kemeny score problem, um, wh whether the score is, is less or equal than S star or not. And if it's less or equal than S star, we just answer yes, and otherwise we just answer no to the question, is there a Kemeny ranking with a score at least S? Okay, so I hope that's clear. Um, um, and that proves that also finding Kemeny rankings is, is NP hard, and that means unless P equals NP, which most people don't believe, there doesn't exist a polynomial time algorithm for computing Kemeny rankings, um, which of course is bad. So it's maybe now it's a good point to, to take a step back and see what we were actually doing here. So we have shown a severe drawback of Kemeny's rule. So last time we have seen these two nice characterizations, and uh, at the beginning of today's lecture, I mentioned all these different points of view that lead you to Kemeny's rule, but computational hardness is, is not good. <laughs> so still, of course, we can use Kemeny's rule in practice as, as Young envisioned in his quote um, for small numbers of alternatives, or maybe if you have additional structure, because as I have, like in, on one of these slides that I uploaded yesterday, I gave several um, standard techniques that people in computer science use once they have shown that the problem is hard. So there are many ways to try to get around this, find a good heuristic that works most of the time. Maybe the instances that you get to see in social choice are all of a very nice nature that allows you to compute Kemeny rankings efficiently in most cases. So things like these could work. But in principle, um, computing Kemeny rankings is hard, which is bad. Um, so there's this other problem that I mentioned uh, briefly, which is to decide whether a given alternative is a Kemeny winner. So Kemeny winner, I haven't defined yet, but I think I mentioned it before, a Kemeny winner would be an alternative that is on top of a Kemeny ranking. It's a very natural notion of a winner once you have Kemeny rankings. Um, and this problem also is NP-hard. And 
So uh, since we have already seen that these two problems are difficult, finding a Kemeny ranking and the Kemeny score problem, so showing that Kemeny winner is also difficult is, is not that difficult. <laughs> Um, and that's why it's in homework exercise on the upcoming exercise sheet, just to get you used to reduction proofs. Okay, so let's see. I think we can finish Kemeny before the break. Um, so there are some additional extra facts about Kemeny's rule, which are kind of interesting. Um, first, one question that you could ask is, uh, um, maybe finding Kemeny rankings for a, s a small constant number of voters is easier because uh, we have discussed previously that if we have only like three voters or five voters, we cannot get every majority graph. So this restricts the set of possible majority graphs that we are looking at. And maybe for these instances, computing a Kemeny ranking can be done more efficiently. However, it has been shown that for every even number of voters that uh, is at least four, or for every odd number of voters, that is at least seven, that computing Kemeny rankings is still difficult. So even, for, even if the number of voters is a small constant, or relatively small constant, um, this is a difficult problem. This second paper here, Bachmeier et al., is a paper um, that I also co-authored. So we, I think we have a total of seven authors, and, and two of them are students from this, from this class many years ago. Um, and, and what we did there is we, that we studied, so this is for the odd number of voters. For even numbers of voters, the problem is relatively easy, but for odd numbers of voters, it was quite difficult, and for, for some time it was open whether Kemeny's, computing Kemeny's rule is difficult for any constant odd number of voters. And we have there shown that for, uh, for at least seven voters, it's already difficult. For three and five, nobody knows, so that's also an open problem. Of course, it's, well, it's the, the gaps become smaller and smaller that people can still fill, but nobody knows whether computing a Kemeny ranking can be done efficiently or not if you have only three voters. Um, okay, so you may wonder why these problems are of, of much interest, because it's really like, they seem quite technical. Um, but I think I did mention in the very first lecture this application of search engine aggregation, um, which is a a specific application of social choice that is quite different from political elections because um, here the number of voters is very small and the number of alternatives is very large because what you want to do there is you take these you, you enter a search term in a search engine and then you get a ranking of websites and you maybe have three different search engines and then you want to find a, a ranking that somehow summarizes these three rankings in one. You want to find a, or you want to have a meta search engine which combines these rankings into one ranking. And a very natural approach to do so would be to use Kemeny's rule. It's a consensus ranking. So it's the ranking that agrees with the outputs of these three search engines the most. Um, and there, I think it makes sense to look at these small constants, like three, four, or five. Um, so that, for instance, means it's, it's unclear whether you can have a meta search engine that aggregates the rankings of three other search engines um, using Kemeny's rule. So it's, it's unclear whether this can be done in polynomial time. Also, this, this first paper in this list here by um, uh, Cynthia Dwork et al. from 2001, um, this is not a social choice paper, so it was published in the International Conference on the World Wide Web, and um, I think the title is Rank Aggregation Methods for the Web. So it's, it's really about like, an internet problem rather than a social choice problem. Okay, so it's open whether we, this problem is still hard for three or five voters. Um, then there are other decision problems you can look at, for instance, deciding whether a given ranking is a Kemeny ranking, r rather than asking whether a, a given alternative is a Kemeny winner. So this problem is co and p-complete, and also the problem of deciding whether a given alternative is a Kemeny winner. So you are going to show in the homework exercise that this is NP-hard, but it's not in NP, it's even harder than the problems in NP. So it's theta 2p complete. So I don't expect anybody to know about this complexity class, um, but it's upper in the polynomial hierarchy. And it basically, uh, or, or in a simplified way, it just means that this is even harder than an NP-hard problem, or an NP, even harder than an NP-complete problem. Um, Right, so um, one thing that you could also think about uh, when, when it comes to computing Kemeny rankings is to approximate the solution, like whenever you have a difficult problem. And there it has been shown that feedback arc set and therefore also computing Kemeny rankings cannot be approximated efficiently. So it has been shown to be APX hard. So there's a lot of name dropping for complexity classes here. Um, but yeah, so they're just short acronyms, so they all fit on the slides, but I don't expect you to be familiar with these notions. And another thing is that if you look at 
weighted tournament feedback architecture. So again, tournaments restrict the, the instances. Um, then interestingly, there has been relatively recently a proof that shows that there's a polynomial time approximation scheme. So within the subset of tournaments, computing Kamini rankings can be approximated, approximated in polynomial time. So un unfortunately, um, I think this particular p-test that is being given here is, 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 is doubly exponential in, in 1 over epsilon, um, which is uh, like the, the distance that you want to have from a Kamini ranking, so it's not really practical. Um, but that's a different issue. So I guess the main point that I want to make on this slide is that um, Everything that has to do with the computation of Kamini rankings um, used to be a quite active area in computational social choice, and some people are still working on that um, because it's such a desirable social preference function and, and uh, showing hardness is not the end of the story. So you can try to, for instance, also look at the fixed parameter tractability, which is a certain technique in theoretical computer science to get more positive results. So look at heuristics or just sample input instances and see how well algorithms are doing there. All right, so let me see whether the next... Yeah, okay, perfect. Um, so this concludes everything that I wanted to say about Kamini's rule, a very appealing social preference function. And uh, after the break, we are going to continue with the next escape route. And there, the function that we are going to talk about, at least at first, is called the top cycle. Um, so let's meet again at 5.35. Okay, thanks. Let's continue. Um, so now we have completed talking about Kamini's rule, which also completes our escape route number two. So just to recap which kinds of escape we already studied uh, from the Erovian impossibilities. So the first one was to consider restricted domains of preferences. Um, and that led us to things like approval voting and median voting for single peak preferences. And um, in the second escape route, we completely ignored these consistency or rationalizability conditions, but replaced them with something that has the similar flavor in the form of reinforcement. So you recall when we introduced reinforcement, we said that it looks very much like the gamma condition that we had um, in choice theory. And on each of these escape rules, we not only escaped these negative results, but we also had complete positive characterizations of attractive social choice functions or social preference functions in the case of Kamini's rule, which is quite nice. So we, we turned these negative results into complete characterizations of attractive rules. And the next escape route is to only require expansion consistency. And that means we need to go all the way back to the second lecture, I think, where we talked about choice theory. We had alpha and gamma and beta plus. I'm going to um, recap those definitions here in today's lecture because uh, we were going to talk about these conditions today. So, come on. Um, okay, so here's this recap. So we had uh, alpha, which is the strongest contraction consistency condition. Maybe let me try to draw a little figures here for each of these conditions, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. So what alpha means is that we have some feasible set, and then if x is chosen, then x is also chosen from any um, subset in which x is contained. Okay, so that was perhaps one of the simplest of these conditions. Um, gamma expansion consistency says that we have two feasible subsets. X is chosen in both of these. And then we are saying that um, X also needs to be chosen in the union of these. Okay, so if X is a best alternative in, in the first feasible set and in the second one, then it also needs to be a best alternative in the union. So this is the condition that sounds very much like reinforcement, but here we are talking about different sets of alternatives rather than different sets of voters. And then we had beta plus, um, which is the condition that we are mostly using in today's lecture, and it's also the one that takes the longest definition here, so maybe most of you also remember it as maybe something obscure that has something to do with expansion, so it's stronger than, than gamma. And it's, it's basically the strongest expansion consistency condition you could think of. And expansion, so these conditions are called contraction and expansion for a reason. So if contraction consistency means if X is chosen in some feasible set, it's also chosen in a smaller feasible set. And here there are no, for alpha, that's why it's the strongest contraction consistency condition. There are basically no extra condition except that X has to be contained in the feasible set, otherwise it cannot be chosen. So that, that's clearly the strongest contraction thing you could think of. If X is chosen in a large set, it also needs to be chosen in any subset in which it is contained. And for beta plus, 
if we want to have the strongest expansion consistency condition, um, well, the only one that I can think of that would be even stronger would, would say that if X is chosen in some feasible set, it's also chosen in all supersets. Okay, but, but this condition, I think I mentioned it a couple of, of weeks ago, doesn't make any sense because, well, X is always chosen from the singleton in which X is contained, and that means that any alternative always needs to be chosen in any feasible set. Okay, th that condition is just too strong. So it says whenever X is chosen, it's also chosen in a superset, so all alternatives always need to be chosen. And that's why we have this extra condition here. If X is chosen in a feasible set, um, like here, then X is also chosen in all supersets whenever, maybe let's use green here to denote the choice set, whenever um, the choice set of this blue set um, overlaps with this red set here. Okay, so when, whenever something from, from this feasible set is chosen, so maybe something here, then we also need to return X because X was among the best elements of the red set here. Okay, so maybe if you want to have it in one single figure, it could look like this. So the green set is the choice set from the blue set, um, and that is this beta plus condition. Okay, and then the two essential statements that we had were that um, rationalizability is equivalent to alpha and gamma, so that was sense theorem, and then Arrow has shown that transitive rationalizability is equivalent to alpha and beta plus. Okay, and that means, so, so all these impossibilities that we have seen used uh, at least rationalizability. Um, some of them used quasi-transitive rationalizability or even transitive rationalizability, but it means all of them used alpha and then they used different degrees of expansion consistency. Okay, so here is uh, again the figure um, where we have seen these results. And our approach of attack for this escape route is now that, is that we are fo focusing on these conditions here because, well, basically, we, we don't want to give up non-dictatorship. Well, that would only allow for dictatorships. That is not something that we find desirable. We don't want to give up Pareto optimality too. So Pareto optimality for two element sets is also a very weak condition. So that basically leaves only these conditions here. Um, and rather than, like, getting rid of rationalizability, we can also try to get around these consistency conditions, and that's what we are doing here, because on this escape route, we are dropping alpha and, rem uh, and, and keep um, beta plus, for instance, in today's lecture and also in the following lectures, uh, gamma, we keep those conditions intact. Okay, so we only drop contraction consistency and keep expansion consistency intact, and we will see that this will give us some quite positive results. Okay. Um, and the, the reason why we focus on expansion consistency um, rather than contraction consistency is the following. So it turns out that Zen has shown a long time ago, in 77, I think, that um, all these impossibilities, or, or virtually all of them, so all the ones that use just rationalizability, um, uh, remain intact if we only use alpha. So if we would only focus on alpha rather than, say, beta plus or gamma, we would still have the same impossibilities. And I'm going to show you th this to you in, in one example. Uh, first, so Sen observed that these impossibility proofs that we have seen are actually statements about the base relation. Okay, And then we know from um, some lemma, second lemma from the second lecture, um, that um, if something can be rationalized, it can be rationalized by the base relation. Right? So that, that, that's always the case. And then we had this third lemma, which showed that if a choice function satisfies alpha, then the base relation has to be acyclic. Okay? And, and all of these impossibility theorems are basically statements about cycles in the base relation. So the base relation doesn't need to be majority rule. That's only the case for this very simple Condorcet may impossibility. But the, the progress that we made to arrows and other impossibilities was that the base relation could be other things different from majority rule, but we still got negative results. Um, and uh, it follows from the observations by Zen that we can take these impossibilities that only use rationalizability um, and then turn them into impossibilities that only use alpha. Okay, and since we know that rationalizability is equivalent to alpha and gamma, that's a strengthening of the impossibility because the way we phrased them previously, they used rationalizability or equivalently alpha and gamma, and now we are just dropping gamma and we still have the same impossibility. And I'm going to show you this for, for the simplest of these impossibilities, and that is the Condorcet-May impossibility. Um, so the first of these results that we have studied. 
So the, the way we studied it, uh, we said that there's no social choice function satisfying anonymity two, neutrality two, positive responsiveness two, and rationalizability. Um, but now we are just replacing rationalizability with, with alpha, and we will see that we still, using the very same construction, will also get a negative result. Um, yes. So let's see how that works. So since it's... Um, well, the Condorcet may impossibility. Um, it's maybe no big surprise what preference profile we are using here. Um, so we have three voters and we have three alternatives. I guess now, by now you can really draw this preference profile or write it down um, um, automatically without thinking about it. So uh, this is our preference profile R. And now we want to show that so we had a couple of axioms here, anonymity, neutrality, positive responsiveness, all in their two versions, but these three axioms were only there to impose that on pairs we have to do majority rule. Okay, so th that we know. We, we used May, May's theorem, you, uh, which, which invokes these three axioms to show that on pairs we just have to do ma what majority rule does. So we just take the alternative which is majority preferred to the other one. And then the only other axiom that we have now is alpha. And now what we do in this profile is a bit similar to what we did, I think, last week in the proof that showed that Condorcet extensions have to violate reinforcement. So we had, I think, the same preference profile only with twos on top here. And then I argued that some alternative needs to be returned, A, or B, or C. And since this thing is completely symmetric, we just assume without loss of generality that it's A. And you can also think of this proof then as a case distinction with three cases. So if it's A, I'm going to do something. If it would be B, I would do something else. And if it's C, I do something else. But I can always do this because this profile is completely symmetric. Okay. In this example, I'm, I can also tell you what we are doing for the other cases. But let's just write this down most compactly as without loss of generality. So something has to be returned. Okay. Now F is this function. Okay. Maybe let's write what we are doing here. Condorcet may impossibility. And it's not just the standard Condorcet may possibility, it's the strong version of it. And it's strong because it only uses alpha rather than rationalizability. Okay, so A has to be among the winners here. Okay, and then the only condition that we now have is, is alpha. And so we have a three element set from which A is chosen. And by alpha, we know that A also needs to be chosen from the two element set AB and from the two element set AC. Okay, AB seems okay, right? Because A is majority preferred to B. AC is not really okay, right? So if we just drop alternative B and we only look at the feasible set consisting of A and C, it turns out that a majority prefers C to A. So from this two element set, A cannot be chosen if we are doing majority rule on two alternative sets. So it violates the other axioms from May's impossibility. And that is basically the end of the proof, right? So we know that using alpha, A also needs to be selected for the same preference profile, and now the feasible set is only A and C. And that's a contradiction. It contradicts May, because from AC, A needs to be selected uniquely. It's majority preferred to A. Uh, C needs to be selected uniquely because it's majority preferred to A. Okay, and I guess so, so, since this is really just a one-liner, I think now, even if we drop this without loss of generality, so if, if B, for instance, would have been selected, um, then we would have just narrowed it down to the two elements at um, A, B, right? And then A majority prefers B because here, these, uh, the majority relation forms a cycle, so we can always find one other alternative that majority dominates the one that has been chosen here, and that's that uh, yeah, proves the entire statement. But here, the important thing now to see is that it only uses alpha. We don't need gamma, which would also be part of rationalizability. It's not required. So I guess that's simple enough, right? Doesn't need any further explanation. Okay. Um, that's good. Whoops. Why? Come on. Okay, so that's what we have shown, the strong Condorcet may impossibility. Um, we have basically dropped gamma. And you can do this to the other impossibilities on this 
like big table that I showed you with the Rovina possibilities. Um, so for instance, there's a strong version of a mass colal Sonnenschein impossibility, which only requires alpha and that says, so this is really much stronger than the Condorcet main possibility. So every social choice function that satisfies IRA, positive responsiveness too, um, and alpha admits a weak dictator. So maybe you vaguely remember what these weaker notions of dictatorships were, but it's not a good thing to have a weak dictator. And all these other conditions are relatively mild. So IRA, we will always assume for social choice functions, positive responsiveness is a relatively demanding condition if you impose it on more than two alternatives. For two alternatives, it's, it's not really a big deal. And then uh, that only um, leaves alpha as, as a condition that we might need to get rid of or replace with something else. And yeah, just for completeness, so it's so Zen in his 77 paper, he even showed that this impossibility still holds if you replace alpha with a very weak form of contraction consistency called alpha minus minus. <laughs> it's some condition that only argues about three element feasible sets. I don't remember the details. It's not really important. It's just um, maybe a reminder that it's not, in principle, in choice theory, there's not only alpha, gamma, and beta plus, there's also a beta without plus, and there's also alpha minus, and alpha minus minus, and epsilon, and, and many other conditions. Okay, but the idea here is just, um, uh, is that contraction is, is evil, so it leads to impossibilities, um, and therefore we will attack um, the impossibility by just dropping contraction and only look at expansion consistency because expansion, of course, still gives us some consistency, um, not as much as also involving uh, contraction consistency, but still we can find functions that only satisfy the expansion part of consistency. And here it turns out that even if we take the strongest condition, beta plus is the strongest expansion consistency condition, um, it doesn't have any negative immediate consequences. In particular, for instance, if we look at the very same preference profile that we have just seen, so the Condorcet paradox profile, three voters, majority cycle. Um, so here, beta plus, so there are functions that satisfy beta plus, um, which, which work fine here. Um, so for instance, and that's probably the only reasonable function you can think of for the majority cycle, is, is that here you make choices according to majority rule, and from all three alternatives, you pick all three, right? So when I'm claiming that this satisfies beta plus, um, even if you don't recall the exact details of beta plus, this is pretty obvious because expansion consistency means if alternative A was chosen in a small feasible set, then it's also chosen in a superset, under a, certain con uh, under a certain condition, but here in the only meaningful super, uh, in the only superset, <laughs> ABC, all three alternatives are chosen. So expansion consistency, so whenever we have a function that returns many alternatives, so for instance, if you always, if you have the trivial function that always returns all alternatives, it satisfies beta plus, so it satisfies the strongest expansion consistency you could think of. Um, so therefore, at least this simple example shows that beta plus itself um, is, is not problematic. So we can have functions that satisfy beta plus. And the top cycle function that we are studying in the rest of today's lecture is a function that satisfies beta plus. And it is a bit better than the trivial function that always returns everything. Okay, so that's what I said already. Um, that too. Okay, and that is yeah, basically an, an outline of what we are going not only today, but also in the coming lectures, because this escape route number three, I think, will be the most extensive escape route in this course. Um, and uh, because here the idea is, so we start with beta plus, we want to look at functions that satisfy beta plus, um, and then we weaken beta plus to gamma, um, and then we will weaken it even further to a condition called rho. So there are many Greek letters available. Um, so that will, will occupy us for several weeks to looking at functions that satisfy um, expansion consistency conditions. So this is again an animation which I think nicely shows how we try to get around this negative result of errors and possibility. So errors and possibility uses these four conditions. Um, so one thing that we are doing today is um, we are again taking these three axioms here which give us majority rule on pairs of alternatives because of May's theorem. So on, on pairs we want to do a majority rule and we have seen many weeks ago so that anonymity is stronger than non-dictatorship and so on. Um, and this condition here, we are making weaker, right? So we cannot make everything stronger because then there would still be an impossibility. So this one here, we are making weaker, but looking at only expansion consistency. So we will start with beta plus, and then there's gamma, and then there's rho, then there's rho plus. 
I guess that should be the other way around, right? So row plus should be stronger than row. <laughs> um, okay, I'm, I, I fixed that. Um, so, but the, the nice thing about this escape route is is that um, we will completely characterize social choice function using any of these conditions and inclusion minimality. So the first main result on this escape route in today's lecture will be a complete characterization of this top cycle function, which I haven't defined yet, by only using beta plus and these conditions here. Okay, and then we will move further to other conditions and they will lead us to, to different and also very interesting social choice functions. Okay, um, right, and as I said, so we were first studying this top cycle function, um, which was proposed independently by many different people, like basically any great concept. Um, so Good, who I'm depicting here, um, I think he, at least to the best of my knowledge, really formalized it first, um, was a mathematician who worked with uh, Hardy, a very famous other mathematician, and also with Alan Turing. Um, he also coined the term technological singularity, which is uh, like a very popular term now if you talk about the progress of artificial intelligence. Um, he was also a consultant for the movie 2001 by Stanley Kubrick, which is one of my favorites, but maybe it's too old <laughs> for you to be interesting. <laughs> Um, so the movie 2001 is not from 2001, it's from 69, I think, so. <laughs> um, but it's still a great movie. Anyway, so, um, so this person and many others proposed this notion of a top cycle, and in order to define the top cycle, we need an auxiliary notion, and that is the notion of a dominant set. Okay? And a dominant set is just a non-empty set of alternatives, such that for every alternative in the set, um, and every alternative outside of the set, x strictly majority dominates y. So x is in, in the set and y is outside of the set. Everything in the set strictly dominates everything outside of the set. Okay, so usually, so I think there's no figure on this slide, but usually if you talk about the top cycle, you think about something like, like a little sun here, with lots of rays. So everything in the set dominates everything outside. Um, Okay, so that, that doesn't define a social choice function yet, it's just an auxiliary notion on graphs, on directed graphs. Um, so, one other auxiliary notion is now the set of dominant sets. So if we just look at some feasible set and only the majority relation, so now you see that we are sh slowly s shifting towards concepts that only depend on the majority relation, now that we have seen McGarvey's theorem, we know that we can only focus on the majority relation, and the set of dominant sets, um, well, it's just defined as follows, so it's just any subset B which is dominant. Okay, so this is a set that contains several sets, so that only consists of set. So maybe the first thing is, is does, in, uh, does every directed graph, or majority graph, because we're only talking about social choice here, does every majority graph uh, admit a dominant set, or is it possible that there are majority graphs which don't have a dominant set? Any ideas? Yes. Exactly. Right. So if we always pick all alternatives, well, then that set is trivially dominant because, well, here we are quantifying over the empty set. So everything in the set dominates everything outside. So there is nothing outside. So the, this condition is trivially satisfied. Okay. So the set of all alternatives is a, is a dominant set. But there can be smaller dominant sets, of course. Um, and what uh, like Good and, and others have shown, it's, well, I didn't call it a theorem because it's, it's fairly obvious, is that the set of dominant sets is totally ordered by set inclusion. Okay, so that, that sounds like a very fancy thing, but it just means that dominant sets are contained in each other. So for a given directed graph, we can have several dominant sets. And this thing here is saying that um, whenever we have a pair of dominant sets, A and B, then either B is contained in A or A is contained in B. Um, and the proof of this is, is fairly simple. I um, guess I can just draw it here. Okay, so we want to show. Oh, no, maybe. Okay, let, let's let's do it. Let's do it here because I want to write down formally um, what we are going to show in black. Okay, so we want to show that whenever we have, now let's call them X and Y, capital X and Y, two dominant sets, for some majority graph or any directed graph, 
so this is a useful statement in graph theory in general, then either x is contained in y or y is contained in x. Okay, um, and why is that the case? Well, now let's prove it by, well, let's say, con yeah, contradiction. So we assume that there are two dominant sets which are not contained in each other, x and y. Okay, so if, if they are not really contained in each other, um, there has to be at least one alternative here in this part, so that means x set minus y, so x without y, and there has to be at least one alternative in y without x. Okay, so then these sets are not contained in each other. Um, but then we already have a contradiction with the definition of dominant sets. Does anybody see why? So the set is dominant if everything in the set strictly dominates everything outside. So there has to be a strict majority. Yeah, okay, now many hands are raising. Maybe I think you were first. <laughs> Yeah, so, is it, so, it, so the set X is, or maybe you want to add something? Yeah? Exactly. Right, so this is the strict majority relation. So a strict majority has to, f has to prefer this alternative to this alternative. And this is because y is a dominant set and x is a dominant set too. So therefore also this alternative has to strictly dominate that alternative. But so this is an asymmetric relation. So it's, uh, it's not possible that two alternatives strictly majority dominate each other. So because it's, well, it's a strict relation. Um, okay, so that's how we define dominant sets. And therefore two dominant sets cannot overlap like they did in this example here. And that means, so if they cannot overlap, um, then this here has to be true. Well, and that just means if we for any directed graph or majority graph look at the structure of dominant sets, um, they just form a hierarchy, right? So if we, uh, so first the set of all alternatives is a dominant set. Well, then there could be smaller ones and even smaller ones and even smaller ones and so on. So, but they just look like this bullseye here. So this is really like a trivial Venn diagram. So all these dominant sets are contained in each other. But I guess that already leads us to how we could define the top cycle, right? Because we haven't really defined the social choice function yet. We only know this notion of dominant sets, but every majority graph can have a very large number of dominant sets. But if they are always contained in each other, um, then it seems somewhat natural, I think you would agree, maybe to take the smallest one, right? So we could also take the largest one, okay? <laughs> um, but usually we want to have a social choice function that returns a small set of winners. And this is how the top cycle is defined. So the top cycle is, in this example, it's this, uh, okay, that's a bit too thick. Uh, this one here. <laughs> Okay, so it's, it's, it's quite a natural notion, right? So, um, because if you think about it, so it's, uh, it's, it seems like a set, uh, like a set theoretic extension of the Condorcet principle, because this, it's like the Condorcet winner dominates all the other alternatives and the dominant set is a set that consists of alternatives that dominate all the other alternatives. Okay, um, so because of this statement that they are totally ordered by set inclusion, every majority graph contains a unique minimal dominant set. And this minimal dominant set is called the top cycle, or we will also call the function that returns uh, the minimal dominant set for every majority graph. Um, we will call this social choice function, the top cycle social choice function. And we are going to denote it by F subscript TC for top cycle. Um, and I think by now everybody knows how it is defined. Uh, still, there are lots of equivalent, just like in the case of Kamini's rule maybe, so lots of equivalent definitions that all define the top cycle as well. Um, yeah, maybe some of you will look a bit confusing to you. So for instance, so it is defined as the minimal dominant set. So we can also, in the, one of the first lectures, we defined this max operator here. So if something is a maximal element according to some relation if there's nothing that is strictly better, okay? Um, and there we used always a preference relation. But we can also use 
uh, set inclusion or superset, uh, the superset relation here as a binary relation. And then this is just the formal way of saying that the top cycle is the minimal dominant set. Okay, so we, uh, we, have, we have to invert this sign here because well, the, the way we defined uh, maximal elements and also well, minimal elements are just defined the, the other way around. Um, the relation has to go like this here. And here we have a set of sets. So this is a set of sets. And this is a relation, a binary relation between sets. Okay, and this is just the formal way of saying it's the minimal dominant set. We can turn around this relation to make it the subset relation, and then we have the max operator. Um, or perhaps even more elegantly, we can have this thing here. Um, what does this mean? So it means this is the set of all dominant sets. And we have seen previously that all these dominant sets are contained in each other. And that means we take the intersection of all these elements of the set of dominant sets. So we take the intersection of all dominant sets. And this is just a fancy way for mathematicians to say we take the smallest one. Right? So the intersection, if they are all contained in each other, um, this, uh, so usually when you take the intersection of many sets, you have to be careful that you don't get the empty set in the end. Um, but here, uh, they are all contained in each other. So this is just a way of saying we take the smallest dominant set. And dominant sets by themselves, by the way, so this is important here, are non-empty by definition, right? So because otherwise, if we wouldn't add non-empty up here, so then the smallest dominant set would always be the empty set. That that's would defeat what we would want to achieve. So that would not be an interesting social choice function. Okay, so let's see. Um, yeah, so I did mention that this concept appeared several times in the literature under many different names. So Thomas Schwartz, who is a political scientist who somehow likes fancy names and fancy acronyms. So this is actually an acronym here, Getcha. I don't remember what the letters stand for. He called it the Getcha set. So he also proposed a variant of it called the Gotcha set, um, <laughs> without T, I think. And then in this, uh, this, is, this is a book from 86. So later uh, in this book, he also proposes a concept that is called Moustache. <laughs> <laughs> also an acronym for something, so for, yeah, so it's, it's a bit funny what, what, what Schwartz is doing in his book. Um, in, uh, maybe more uh, often it is also known as the Smith set because it was also independently from good proposed by Smith, who was also the one who gave this characterization of scoring rules together with Peyton Young. So I think that, so I, we had two authors for this because they independently proved the characterization of scoring rule. And this is the same Smith Smithy. I think it's even the same paper where he proposed the character, where he got the characterization of scoring rules and also proposed this notion of the so-called Smith set or top cycle. Um, all right. Ah, okay. So I actually I wanted to have uh, <laughs> I wanted to ask you about this. But um, so, do you think that the top cycle is a Condorcet extension? Um, it is, um, and uh, I hope you see why that is the case, right? Because if you have a Condorcet winner, well, then this singleton set consisting of the Condorcet winner is a dominant set, and there can be no smaller set than a one-element dominant set. So, so that, that means we already have one attractive property of the top cycle. So whenever there is a Condorcet winner, that will be returned by the top cycle. Because otherwise, you could imagine that maybe it returns relatively large sets. But whenever there is a Condorcet winner, it will just only pick the Condorcet winner, which is nice. Um, and in the following, we would like to study the properties of the top cycle axiomatic ones um, and also look at the characterization. And then later, of course, also study, can we compute the top cycle efficiently, giving some preference profile or some majority graph. OK. Um, so the main result for today's lecture um, is to show that the top cycle is the finest social choice function, satisfying anonymity, neutrality, positive responsiveness to, um, and beta plus. OK, so again, the first three conditions only make sure that on pairs we are doing majority rule by invoking May's theorem. Um, essentially, this is a, like, almost like a single axiom characterization beca because apart from the majority rule part, we only need beta plus and this obscure finest thing. Um, so th this doesn't mean that it's a great social choice function. Um, so finest is formally defined in the following sense. So a social choice function is finer than another social choice function. Um, if it always returns subsets of the former. Okay, so this is just a short way of saying, um, okay, maybe let's write it out here. So this, because this is really a set, is always contained in this set for all, uh, comma a, okay, 
um, and since mathematicians are usually lazy, they just write it for functions like this. Okay, so in other words, the top cycle is in, in some sense the um, the most discriminating social choice function that re that satisfies beta plus. Okay, so if we want social choice functions that return small sets of alternatives that don't always return everything, um, um, then this finest uh, condition is is uh, quite useful, and it's also necessary for the characterization here. So, for instance, if you drop finest. Um, Okay, now you have to be careful that you cannot just uh, take the trivial function which always returns everything because that wouldn't satisfy these three conditions on two alternative sets, right? So if you always return everything, then, then even on two alternative sets you would return everything and that is different from majority rule. But you can take the function that on two alternative sets is majority rule and on all other feasible sets it always returns everything. Okay, so that function would also satisfy all the axioms in this characterization here, um, except that it's not the finest such function. Okay, so there are, there are smaller ones um, that also satisfy the axioms. Another maybe more reasonable example would be, um, so you always return all alternatives except a Condorcet loser whenever there is one. So this function, so it's not obvious at this point that it satisfies beta plus, but this function satisfies beta plus and clearly it also satisfies these three conditions here, um, but it's uh, coarser than the top cycle. So the top cycle is finer than this other function that I mentioned. So, in, in other words, there is no s such social choice function, by such I mean one that satisfies these four conditions here, that is finer than FTC. Okay, so the top cycle is like the most discriminating function that satisfies these conditions. And we are going to prove the statement um, on the whiteboard. And so, the the, the, like the approach that we use to prove this statement uh, will be also reused in upcoming lectures. That's um, I am going to emphasize this when we are doing this proof here because in other lectures we will have similar statements using other expansion consistency conditions. For instance, next time we are going to prove a characterization of a different social choice function, which is the finest one that satisfies gamma, um, like a weaker expansion consistency condition. All right, so let's prove this characterization. So the essential property in this characterization, as I said, is really just beta plus, um, because all the other conditions are only there to make sure that on pairs we do majority rule. So therefore, let's recap what beta plus actually means, because I'm sure that many of you keep forgetting it. Even I myself sometimes forget what beta plus is actually defined. Um, so we have two feasible sets, B and A. Um, B is a subset of A, and then if what is chosen from A intersects with B. Okay, so maybe you remember that like half an hour ago I said that this is the extra condition that we need in order to make this condition interesting. Um, then everything that was chosen from B is also chosen from A. Okay, so in the like half an hour ago I was just talking about one element X. So um, there are, these are equivalent ways of writing down these conditions. So um, here I'm just talking about everything that is chosen from B rather than just a single element X. Now this can be nicely drawn. Um, so here let's have this large set A. Um, then something is chosen from this. Oh, that was a bit too large. Something is chosen from this feasible set, that's f of a. And then we have some set b. Okay, And now what this statement here says is that um, since uh, b overlaps with f of a, so clearly there's an overlap here, then all the alternatives that are chosen from b have to be con have also be chosen have also to be chosen from from A. So that means everything. So we don't know what the choice set here is, but it's chosen from B. But it has to lie in here, right? So the best elements of B have to lie at this intersection here. Okay. So that was just a recap of beta plus, um, the essential condition for this proof. And now the actual proof is uh, split into two different statements. Um, the first statement says that whenever a social choice function satisfies these given conditions, then, it, uh, then the top cycle is a refinement of that choice function. 
Okay, so whenever something satisfies uh, anonymity, neutrality, positive responsiveness, and beta plus, then it contains the top cycle. Um, because we eventually want to show that the top cycle is the finest of these. So that is the, like, the most important part of the proof. And then the second part is something that you sometimes tend to forget, or that the people sometimes tend to forget, is that we also need to show, because th the first statement shows that, um, that every function that satisfies the axioms contains, is, is a, like a coarsening of this top cycle function, but what remains to be shown is that the top cycle function itself satisfies those axioms. Right? It could be that the subset um, is, is too small and that it doesn't even satisfy the axioms. Therefore, the second statement is to show that TC itself satisfies these four statements, uh, these four axioms, sorry. Okay, but the first part is the more interesting one. So we have that F satisfies anonymity, um, neutrality, PR2, um, and beta plus. And we want to show that this implies that FTC is a refinement of F. Okay, so F is any function that satisfies these, these axioms, and then we want to show that FTC is a refinement of that function. Okay, and this works by a single application of beta plus. So it's once you see the proof, I think you are not, um, uh, ho hopefully you are impressed, but maybe you, you have, would have expected uh, a more difficult proof here. So we fix just a preference profile and a feasible set. And then since basically the only condition except the ones that just invoke arrow, uh, Mace theorem um, is beta plus, we basically need to apply beta plus here. And um, that means, so we can just basically re reuse this figure here. Okay, so we have some feasible set. F of A is what is chosen from this feasible set. And now we have pick B in some interesting way. Um, and the way we do this is we let B um, be a two element set that only consists of two elements x and y and x is inside here and y oops is outside of f of a okay so that's that's how we pick this two element set um, b okay so let's just write down what we have done here Okay, so x is just as you see in the figure, it's an f of a, and y is outside of f of a. Okay, and now, um, uh, ah, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> Now, um, the preconditions uh, or the, 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 the precondition for the beta plus condition is satisfied. Okay, so we have two sets B and A that are contained in each other, so this intersection is non empty. And then what beta plus says is that everything that, has to, that is selected from this two element set B has to be contained in FA. Okay, so previously I already said that um, beta plus means that what is chosen from the set B has to be contained in here. Okay, but since, since we have only two elements in the set, and basically here there is only a single element, it means that only x can be chosen from this two element set. Okay, is that clear? So everything that has to be chosen from B has to, be, has to lie at this intersection, but that only leaves room for this single element x. Okay, so beta plus implies that f of B is the singleton x. Um, okay, because well, the intersection of B and F of A, so this thing here just consists of a single alternative and something has to be chosen. Okay, but that means that um, here we have choice from a two element set and now we have all the other conditions um, for, for May's uh, uh, theorem that if from a two element set we are only picking one alternative, we know something about the majority relation between those two alternatives. Right. If, if from this two element set we are only picking x, there has to be, maybe let's use a different color for this one, there has to be a majority x edge from x to y. Right? And this would hold 
for any two element set of alternatives B, um, where one alternative is inside of the set and the other one is outside of the set. And therefore, oops. Um, this is equivalent because of May to saying that X majority dominates Y. Okay, and since we just picked this two element set arbitrarily with one alternative in the set and one outside of the set, we have this, like what I call the sun ray representation where everything in the set dominates everything outside. So everything that is inside here has to dominate everything outside because we can just pick any two element set as we desire here. And then we have the single application of beta plus which gives us that statement. Okay, and that means that um, F of A is a dominant set and therefore the top cycle has to be a refinement of, of F because the top cycle is the smallest dominant set. So we know by this argument that any function F that satisfies the axioms can only return dominant sets. And TC returns the smallest dominant set and therefore this statement here is correct. Okay, the smallest dominant set is contained in all the other dominant sets. Everybody agrees? Okay, so I'll just leave it here. You can still read it if you need to read it again and because I will continue proving the second part and the second part is just that FTC satisfies all of these conditions here. Okay, so that's the part where I said you have to be careful not to forget this. Many of these conditions are like very simple to show, namely those three here. So this top cycle function is anonymous, right? It only depends on the majority relation. So the identities of the voters don't matter. It's also neutral. We are not making any distinctions based on the identities of alternatives. It satisfies positive responsiveness too. So on two alternatives, it is majority rule. The only interesting part is, does it satisfy beta plus? Okay, and in order to see that it satisfies beta plus, let me just copy this figure here. And change it a bit. Um, okay, so for, for this, yeah. We can assume that we are now talking about the top cycle. Okay, so this is the function that returns the smallest dominant set and we want to show that it satisfies beta plus. Okay, so that means whenever we have some red set B here, okay, it doesn't need to be this two element set which we used in the previous proof, but could be any set B here. Um, then if this intersection is non-empty as I did in the figure, then what is chosen from the subset B has to be contained in the choice set from A or in other words, uh, maybe highlighted it like this. Whatever is chosen from B has to, okay, no, let's make it a bit nicer. Whatever is chosen from um, the set B has to lie in this orange area here. Okay. Um, so this is the set B and for whatever is chosen from B has to lie in this orange area here. Okay, and we know that this thing here, so this set here, is a dominant set. So it only has outgoing edges. I think I used green before, um, the darker one. Um, so this one is a dominant set. So if we now restrict attention to the feasible set B, so we only look at this red set here, what can we say about the top cycle of this red set here? Or maybe phrased differently, do we, do we, can you already see a dominant set within this red set here? <laughs> yes. Yes, right, so, so therefore this is a dominant set, but I'm not sure whether you said in the beginning that it's also the top cycle. 
the, the orange set within the set B doesn't have to be the top cycle. There could be a smaller one here, right? Because the only thing we know about minimality is that this dominant set here is minimal in this large set here. Okay, but it could be here that's, so first this is a dominant set, but the top cycle itself could be smaller. It could be some, some smaller set in there. Um, so it could be something right in here, but it doesn't matter because the only thing that we need for the statement is just that it's contained in the orange area. And since the orange area is a dominant set, the smallest dominant set has to be contained in this orange area. Okay. Um, okay, so let's write this down formally. So FTC of A intersects B is a dominant set, so the orange area. Um, and this implies that whatever the top cycle of this red set B is, it has to lie in the orange area. It could be the orange area itself or something smaller. So FTC of B is a subset of FTC of A. And this is exactly what we wanted to show because here this is beta plus, and this is what we have shown for the top cycle. Only now that we have subscripts TC here, so we wanted to show that the top cycle satisfies the beta plus condition. Okay, so in both of these things taken together, um, proof that the top cycle is the smallest um, function that satisfies anonymity, neutrality, positive responsiveness to, and beta plus, or the finest function. That's how it is called. Okay, other questions regarding this proof? Good, um, because as I said, so these kinds of proofs are proofs that you're going to see over and over again using different types of consistency conditions. Okay. Um, so I think that, that gives a very nice motivation for, for studying the top cycle because we are on this escape route and now we have seen alpha is bad. We just take, we just drop alpha. We take the strongest expansion consistency condition um, and we strengthen the other axioms, non-dictatorship to anonymity and so forth. And then we have a complete characterization of the top cycle. Um, well, complete depends on how you define things. But so some people say that because of finest, um, it's, it's not really a complete characterization. But if this is taken almost like an axiom, then the top cycle is uniquely characterized by this. Okay, now uh, in the rest of the lecture, I would just like to get some more like insights in the top cycle. Um, and that will hopefully also help us in eventually to either find an algorithm for computing the top cycle or prove that this thing is uh, NP hard to compute. Okay, so first there's a couple of examples. Um, so for instance, in, in this uh, simple majority graph, um, we have four different alternatives here. Um, what would be the top cycle here? So which alternatives are contained in the top cycle and which ones are not? Ah, okay, so now you're saying ABC is a dominant set, right? Okay, I thought in the beginning you said A, B, C, D, but um, maybe I... Sorry, A, B, C, I mean A, B, C. A, B, C sounds much better than A, B, C, D. But yeah, so A, B, C, D is also a dominant set, so as always, um, yes. But um, A, B, C is, is a dominant set because A, B, and C, they all dominate this alternative D here. Um, so you're right. Um, so it's relatively easy to check whether a given set is a dominant set. We only need to look whether it has only outgoing edges. Um, and if there are only outgoing edges, then as you did, that, that's right. But you also explained why there is no smaller set because th that can be a bit more difficult for larger graphs um, to check whether no subset um, is also a dominant set. Um, and that's also required for proving that this is the top cycle. But you already said that uh, each of these alternatives has an ingoing edge and also the two element sets also have ingoing edges. And, and therefore, ABCD is the unique smallest dominant set. So in this, in this tournament graph, there are exactly two dominant sets, ABCD and ABC. Okay. Um, all right, so this is also a Condorcet loser here, right? So the Condorcet loser is excluded. Now let's, I think, flip around one of these edges here. So now D dominates B rather than B, dominate, uh, than B dominates D. What would be the top cycle now? 
Yes? All of them. Uh, anybody disagrees? No. Yeah, because it's correct. Um, <laughs> ABCD is uh, the top cycle here. So there's no. So again, proving that ABCD is a dominant set, in, in this case, is even completely trivial because it's the set of all alternatives. But showing or well, verifying that no subset is dominant uh, can be a bit tedious. But here we have already done, I already told you that this is only a single edge that changed here. And now we know that the one element sets, the two element sets, and also the three element sets um, are not dominant sets. Okay, so the, the reason why I'm showing these examples is we, we want to get some intuition in order to um, maybe develop an algorithm or proof hardness. <laughs> so, and of course, uh, <laughs> instances get larger now to make them more interesting. Um, so, any ideas here what the top cycle could be? So, I guess here you need a bit more time. Uh, yes, you. Also <laughs> I, I actually, I meant you, but yeah, so <laughs> sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. So F, C, and E, you said, right? So they form a three cycle. And now what we need to check is whether these three only have outgoing edges to the other three alternatives. Did you want to say the same thing? Okay. <laughs> um, anybody disagrees? So it's, it's definitely a dominant set. Um, since it's a three cycle, it already that already shows that no subset can be dominant, right? Um, because whenever we take a subset, it has to have ingoing edges, and this is correct. Um, so C F is um, the unique minimal dominant set in this in this uh, majority graph here. Um, yeah, okay. But here, I guess maybe you can already imagine that if you have uh, like very large graphs, at least at this point, it's not clear how we can quickly find um, the top cycle. We can quickly check whether a set is a dominant set. But um, checking whether all subsets are not dominant sets could be difficult, right? Because the number of subsets, of course, is exponential in general. Um, one other like, tiny tidbit about tournament graphs, which we will talk about more and more in the future. So this one here, uh, we will encounter many times um, because well, it's, so there, there are like, several important uh, tournament graphs. The three cycle, of course, because of the Condorcet paradox. And this here is basically the only interesting tournament graph on four alternatives because it has no Condorcet winner and no Condorcet loser. And there's only a unique up to isomorphism um, graph that has this property on four alternatives. That's just as a side comment. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. I, I actually wanted to again do an audience participation. Okay. Um, so the top cycle can be computed efficiently. <laughs> So it's, it's not NP-hard, so may maybe some of you have, uh, have thought at this point that maybe we can somehow prove hardness because you basically need to uh, look at all the different subsets of a given set and check whether none of these subsets is a dominant set. But the top cycle um, can be computed efficiently. And actually, the algorithm is relatively simple. And we can even, like, we, we will s first start with an algorithm that is clearly polynomial time, and then we will improve it a bit further to even make it a linear time algorithm. So that just means that we only need to look at all the inputs um, at most once. So and the inputs here would be the edges of the majority graph. Um, and the idea for this algorithm is as follows. So we first have like a, like a subroutine, which gives us the minimal dominant set um, that contains some given alternative x. OK, so basically, we, we just guess a starting alternative x. So we don't know which alternative is definitely contained in the top cycle. We just guess an alternative x. And then we construct the minimal dominant set um, that contains uh, x. And um, once we have such an algorithm, we can also compute the top cycle because we can, we can run this algorithm if that one runs in polynomial time. And we can run it with every different alternative x. And then we get lots of minimal uh, dominant sets that contain a, a given alternative. And then we can then just take the smallest of these. So that it's, it's not the most efficient version of doing it, but I think the most straightforward one if you want to um, see how this could work. Um, and how, how can we find the minimal dominant set containing some alternative x? So let me try to draw it maybe here. OK, so we just, 
like we have, we have a working set that in the beginning only consists of x, and then we add alternatives that definitely need to be added in order to make this a dominant set. Okay, so which alternatives would need to be added if we start with a singleton set x here, um, because otherwise this set cannot be a dominant set. Yes? Right, exactly. So all alternatives that, an if that have an incoming edge to x um, need to be added for sure, right? So otherwise we can never um, make this into a dominant set that contains this given starting alternative x. Now, one thing that you have to be careful about now is whether you take these incoming edges, whether they are strict or weak majority edges. Um, because if you, if you are working in tournaments, it's the same thing, so there's no problem. Um, but here uh, it has to be like all alternatives that weakly majority dominate x, because these are precisely the ones that are not strictly dominated by x. Okay, so everything that is strictly dominated by x is fine, so those are already covered by x. Um, everything that weakly dominates x are precisely the ones that are not strictly dominated by x, and those we need to collect in order to make the set larger. So that means we need to add alternatives that dominate x. Okay, so maybe those two here. Okay, and then we have a new working set. Um, and again, then we can check, is this a dominant set? If, if not, it means that there are alternatives that are weakly dominating something in the current set. Right, so these are further witnesses to the fact that the current working set is not a dominant set. And then we need to add those again. So this defines a simple iterative algorithm, which just uh, constructs the smallest dominant set that contains um, this given alternative x. Okay, so we, we start with x, we add everything that dominates x, then we have a larger working set, we look at everything that dominates something in the current working set, we add those as well. And at one point, there will be no further alternatives left to be added, either because we have exhausted all the alternatives, or because, uh, or because what we have found is a dominant set, which dominates everything outside. Okay, so let's just maybe continue this here. So we keep adding more and more alternatives. Um, and uh, we only stop if we cannot find more such alternatives. Formally, we initialize uh, this working set B with the singleton x, and then we iteratively add all alternatives that weakly majority dominate an alternative in B um, until no more such alternatives can be found. Okay, so this, this algorithm already gives us a polynomial time algorithm, not for only computing the set of dominant sets, um, but even um, uh, we can also find the minimal dominant set that way by just starting with any different alternative x um, and then just comparing all of the dominant sets we have in the end. But before we get there, um, let's just make this uh, like a bit more formal. So this is a notation that will be useful not only in today's lecture, but also in upcoming lectures. And um, so you may wonder at this point why this is called d star bar x. Um, so we, because we will, in, in an upcoming lecture, we are going to define the notions of a dominion of an alternative and the set of dominators of an alternative. And this is like the iterated dominators. Um, and this just means, so d, d bar star of x just consists of all alternative x1 that have some path that leads to x. Okay, so anything that leads to x on some weak majority path, so this is basically what we have been doing here, is contained in the set d bar star x. And then it turns out that the set of dominant sets that we have defined is completely characterized by this, okay? Um, because if we... So this is a set of sets, the set of dominant sets, and um, each of these sets has to contain some alternative, so some alternative x, and in order to make this a, a minimal dominant set that contains x, we just have to add all the alternatives that have some weak majority path uh, leading to, to x. And once we have added uh, all these alternatives, then we just have found the smallest dominant set that contains x. And taking all of these together, so this again, of course, is a set of sets, gives us completely the set of dominant sets as defined here. Okay, but more now regarding the computation. Um, so we can now com compute the set of dominant sets using this algorithm here. Um, so the, the running time is, so this is the number of alternatives, is the number of alternatives to the three. Um, because, um, so we guess a starting alternative, um, and then we need to look at, at all the edges for any of these, uh, in the worst case at least, we have to look at all the edges for any of these starting alternatives, um, and, and that's why it's uh, a to the two um, times a, which is a to the three. Um, and ideally what we would like to have is an algorithm that um, runs in 
cardinality of a to the 2. Right? So you may, may be surprised now because I promised a linear time algorithm, um, but this would be linear because here the input of the problem is the majority graph. Um, but actually, it's the preference profile. But so the, the, the notion of a dominant set or the top cycle only depends on the majority graph. And then the, num the size of the input is already quadratic in the number of vertices. So, so the number of edges in a directed graph um, on, on n vertices um, is, is O of n square. So that's why if we have an, like an uh, cardinality of a to the 2 algorithm, we would call this a linear time algorithm, even so there's a 2 in the exponent, which may seem a bit confusing. Um, okay, so this just means we can also compute the top cycle efficiently. And now a linear time algorithm would be one which only um, runs in a to the 2. And like the, the obvious reason to optimize this algorithm would be that if we don't have to guess the starting alternative, if we can find a starting alternative quickly with, without needing to guess, uh, so if we just can identify one alternative x which is definitely contained in the top cycle, um, then we start with this alternative, run this algorithm, and then we have found the smallest dominant set containing x, which would also be the smallest dominant set overall because x was promised to be contained in the top cycle. So the only missing part here is, is that um, we need to be able to, in linear time, also find an alternative that is definitely contained in the top cycle. Okay, and, and this will be the last progress that we are making today on this algorithm. Um, and interestingly, so there's a very simple and nice method for finding an alternative that is definitely contained in the top cycle. Um, and that would be any alternative with maximum degree or a Copeland winner. Okay, so for Copeland winners, so we had this definition where we just count the number of outgoing edges and then also we added some score for these majority ties. But if you are confused by majority ties, you can, you can restrict attention to the case of tournaments. Um, but it can be shown that the set of Copeland winners is a ref or the, this Copeland function is a refinement of the top cycle function. Or in other words, the Copeland winners are always contained in the top cycle, and therefore we can compute um, uh, the top cycle in linear time because Copeland winners, so the vertices with the highest number of outgoing edges in a tournament, we can of course quickly find, right? So because th th that is just straightforward by, by looking at this majority graph. So the only interesting thing that needs to be shown now is that the set of Copeland winners is contained in the set in the in the top cycle here. And that is something even so there's only a few minutes left, but it's a very simple argument. It only needs one graph. Um, that is what I'm going to show you. So F Copeland is a refinement of F top cycle. Okay, so as I said already, so if you look back at the definitions uh, that we had for these functions for Copeland, we were just counting the number of strictly dominated alternatives, and then we just, uh, they, they counted as one, and then we just added half a point for each majority tie. Okay, so the, the proof also works if you have majority ties, but it's probably easier to understand if you only look at uh, the case of tournaments where we don't have majority ties. And the reason is relatively simple. So if this here is the top cycle, we want to show that the Copeland winners, the one with max maximal degree, are contained in the top cycle. Um, we assume now for contradiction that this is not the case. So let's say that this here is a Copeland winner, this alternative A, but it's not contained in the top cycle. Okay, And this here is a top cycle, so let's again use these green edges here. So this has only outgoing edges in terms of the majority. So that means that all the alternatives that are dominated by A lie outside of the top cycle, right? So that it's, it's impossible that A dominates something inside of the top cycle. So everything that A dominates has to be somewhere down here. Okay, but that already shows that everything that is in the top cycle has a strictly higher out degree, right? Because it dominates everything that A dominates plus A itself. And so this is how this, so this already completes the proof. So Copeland winner has to be contained in the top cycle because if it's outside, there's a contradiction. And now to make it completely precise, also if we don't have, uh, also if we have majority ties, um, here even all the alternatives that are only weakly dominated by A lie outside of the top cycle. Okay? And everything that is in the top cycle, every alternative in here strictly dominates. Um, everything that is outside. Okay, so therefore the Copeland score, um, even if you also take into account majority ties, of anything in the inside of the top cycle is strictly larger than 
than of everything that is outside of the top cycle. And that is the main argument. Everything that is in here has a strictly higher Copeland score than everything that is outside. And using this argument, we can just um, have a linear time algorithm for the top cycle, which works as follows. So we just take any alternative with maximal Copeland score, or all the alternatives, all of them have to be contained in the top cycle, and then we just run this iterative algorithm which just keeps adding alternatives um, that point towards the current working set. So, and therefore, like this six alternative example, for instance, that I previously showed you, so that, for instance, for this example, you can easily compute the top cycle, and even for, because it's only linear time, so even if we give you a tournament or a majority graph, I don't know, with 20 vertices or something, in principle, it would be relatively simple to compute the top cycle. So in contrast to the Kemeny problem, this is a, is a very simple problem. So Kemeny's rule is difficult to compute for a large number of alternatives. The top cycle can be computed extremely efficiently. Okay, um, that's it for today's lecture. So I think I have one or two slides left for the top cycle that we will do next week, and then we will move on to another social choice function next week, which is called the uncovered set. Okay, thanks for your attention. <laughs>